I'd like to speak about Jesus as King. Amen. So we get a, maybe a new or a refreshed vision, you know, and of him as king and allow more of his rule to manifest in our lives. So let's take a look at some scriptures. There are many Old Testament references to Jesus as king, prophesying to the coming king. Zechariah 9.9 9 says, Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout in triumph, O daughter of Jerusalem. See, your king comes to you, righteous and victorious, humble and riding on a donkey, on a colt, the fowl of a donkey. And Jeremiah 23, 5 says, Behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will raise up for David a righteous branch, and he will reign as king and act wisely and do justice and righteousness in the land. Psalm 2, 6 but as for me, I have installed my king upon Zion, my holy hill. Amen. And then in the New Testament, we have several references to Jesus as king. Revelations 19, 16. And on his robe and on his thigh, he has the name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Revelation 17, 14. These will weigh war these will wage war against the Lamb, and the Lamb will overcome them, because he is the Lord of lords and the King of kings, and those who are with him are, the, are called and chosen and faithful. And the final one from the New Testament, 1 Timothy 6, 14 to 15. Keep this commandment without stain or reproach until the appearance of our Lord Jesus Christ, which he will bring about at the proper time, he who is the blessed and only sovereign, the King of kings and the Lord of hosts, the Lord of lords. Wow, there's a light right here that uh, I haven't had it reflect off my, uh, my, my iPad before, whatever this is. There, maybe that's a little bit better. Um, others also acknowledged his kingship. Nathaniel and, first, and John, first uh, one, I should say, John 1.49 Nathanael answered him, Rabbi, you are the son of God, you are the king of Israel. And of course, we know that the uh, wise men from the east said, Where is he who has been born king of the Jews? For we saw his star in the east and have come to worship him. Amen. And then we know when Jesus entered Jerusalem, all the people gathered together and, and said, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, even the king of Israel. Jesus acknowledged his kingship. Therefore Pilate said to him, So you are a king? And Jesus answered, You say correctly that I am a king. For this I have been born, and for this I have come into the world to testify to the truth. Everyone who is of the truth hears my voice. Jesus is king. Amen. But you know, you can't be a king without a kingdom, right? And Jesus brought a kingdom. In fact, that was his main message. It wasn't so much that he was king, but he was bringing a kingdom. But then if he was bringing a kingdom, therefore he would be a king. And so he was always preaching the kingdom, how to enter into the kingdom, what the kingdom looked like, and so forth. So he brought the kingdom. Matthew 4, 23 says, And Jesus went about all Galilee, teaching in their synagogues, preaching the gospel of the kingdom, and healing all kinds of sickness and all kinds of disease among the people. Matthew 10, 17, As you go, preach this message, the kingdom of heaven is near. And Matthew 12, 28, But if I cast out demons by the Spirit of God, then the kingdom of God has come upon you. Now, the word kingdom, you know, when we hear the word kingdom, we usually think of land or a territory, you know, that the, that, the, that the king rules over, and it is that sense. But the Baker's Evangelical Dictionary says that in both the Old Testament and in the New Testament, the term kingdom is understood as dynamic in nature and refers primarily to the rule or reign of a king. <clears throat> it is seldom used in a static sense to refer to a territory. As a result, the vast majority of instances, it would be better to translate the expression kingdom of God as the rule of God. So Jesus came to establish the rule of God, first in us and then through us in all levels of society. And as we know, when he returns, that rule of God will be established, you know, established with the entire planet. 
Amen. When a king rules, he exercises ultimate power and authority over everything and everyone. That's what a king does. He exerts his power and authority to conform things to his will. That's ruling. The will of the king is done. Jesus said, and I, I, I uh, said another uh, scripture close to this, but if I cast out demons by the Spirit of God, then the kingdom of God has come upon you. That means the rule of God has been established and manifested in this situation. So when he cast a demon out of somebody, the rule of God now operated in this person's life because his will now operated. It wasn't his will that people should be, you know, bound by demons or bound by sickness. So when he cast out demons and when he healed people, the rule of God went forth into these people. He now ruled in the at area of that person because that's what a king does. That's what his will was. His will was to set free po- people free, to cast out demons, and to heal people. That's his rule, that's his will, and that's what happens when the king rules. Amen? Amen. So what would things look like down here when he rules? Well, we get a glimpse of what it will look like in the Old Testament. God was to be the, to the Israelites' king, king in the Old Testament. With his rule would come awesome blessings. And we know that he took the, um, the Israelites out of Egypt and he placed them in the promised land and he gave them wonderful promises. He said, this is what's going to happen. I'm your king and this is what will happen as my rule goes forward. This is my will for you. And we get a good sample of it in Deuteronomy 28. And he tells them, if you are faithful and follow my commandments, all these blessings will come upon you and overtake you if you obey the voice of the Lord your God. You will be blessed in the city. So this, is, this is, uh, gives you a glimpse of what happens when God rules. This is his rule and his will for us. You will be blessed in the city, and you're going to be blessed in the country. The fruit of your womb will be blessed, as well as the produce of your land and the offspring of your livestock the calves of your herds and the lambs of your, fo- uh, of your flocks. Your basket and kneading bowl will be blessed. You will be blessed when you come in and blessed when you go out. The Lord will cause the enemies who rise up against you to be defeated before you. They will march out against you in one direction, but flee from you in seven. And the Lord will decree a blessing upon your barns and everything that you put your hands to. And he will bless you in the land that he is giving you. And the Lord will make you prosper abundantly. And he goes on to say, the Bible goes on to say, the fruit of your womb, the offspring of your livestock, in every, in every aspect of your life. That's a picture of the rule of the king. That is his will. Right? That's, how, uh, that's a glimpse of how awesome life would be under God's rule in the promised land. There would be great joy There'll be no, no, no sickness, no disease, no suffering. They're prosperous. They're victorious against any enemy. That what was living under God's rule as a king would be like to, for the Israelites. One con- commentator said, when the kingdom of God or God's rule invades our world, it becomes like heaven on earth. Poverty turns into prosperity. Sickness into health. Sinful areas are cleansed and we walk in holiness. That's what God's rule looks like. That's what our king desires to bring to us, desires for us, desires everything to be conformed to his will, to bring those blessings. However, we know in the Old Testament that the Israelites, they weren't obedient. In fact, they weren't obedient, and then God's blessing was withdrawn in a sense, and they were open, and they know that they were invaded, and they went through lots of suffering, and they would cry out for God, and then God would deliver them, and they went over this over and time and time again. And the Israelites got to a point where they actually said, you know what? We want a king. We don't want God to be the king over us, which is amazing. They didn't even want Samuel sort of to rule over them. They said in 1 Samuel, eight, and, and Samuel takes this to the Lord, and the Lord says to Samuel, he says, Listen to all the people are saying to you. It is not you they have rejected, but they have rejected me as their king. It's astonishing, isn't it? Because as a king, if they would have respected him and honored and worshipped only Jesus, the king, God, that's the kind of life that they could have lived in. That would have been the rule, the king's rule for them. Perfect health. You know, being blessed and blessed and blessed. And yet they were always led asway uh, against, for, you know, to, to worship other, uh, well, idols, not other gods, but idols, false, false gods. 
and they would lose this rule of the king, and he had so much planned for them. People may reject Jesus as their king, but Jesus is never not king. I don't know if that's good English or not, but it doesn't matter. You may reject him, you may not be walking with him, you may not even believe in his rule, but that doesn't in one iota affect that Jesus is king. If we were to step into the spiritual realm, there would be no doubt in our minds who is king. Right? If we were to, to visit heaven, there would be no doubt in our minds who is king there. If we could witness, let's say, in the spiritual realm, some demon beings you know, coming close to Jesus, we would witness who is king. We would see the demons fall down, not even be able to talk. I don't even think they'd be able to get close to Jesus. That's the power and authority he has. He is king. We get a glimpse in the Gospels about exactly um, this, exactly about this sort of how the demons would react when Jesus comes near them. We know that when, when people were, had demon possession, you know that the demons would, would come out, they would cry, they would tremble, they would be fearful of Jesus. They knew who he was. There was no doubt in the mind of a demon who Jesus was. They knew he was king. They knew he was Lord. You might remember the story of the Gadarene demoniac, or Gerizim, depending on which um, translation you have. And you know that Jesus went over to this area, and he was met by this man that was very much, you know, demonized by a whole legions of demons. So I'll just read a few verses of that story. They came to the other side of the sea, into the, the country of the Gerizim's. And he got out of the boat, that's Jesus. When Jesus got out of the boat, immediately a man from the tombs, with an unclean spirit, met him. And seeing Jesus from a distance, he ran and bowed down before him. And shouting with a loud voice, he said, What business do we have with each other? Jesus, Son of the Most High God, I implore you by God, do not torment me. Now this is a very interesting case and something that I thought about this week. This man ran and bowed down to Jesus. I don't believe it was the man himself who did this. You see, I believe he was so possessed, this man spent all of his time in the tombs, cutting himself and doing crazy things. I don't think this man was in control of his faculties or anything. I believe it was the demons that caused him to run and, and, and caused this person's body to bow down. You see, it was the demons that were bowing down to the Lord, not so much this man, because I think this man was clueless about who Jesus was. He would have no idea. So it was the demons inside that caused, him, you know, caused the man to bow down because they were bowing down to the King of Kings, right? Bowing down, worshiping Jesus. You notice that the, Jesus, uh, that the demon didn't, you know, question Jesus, like, well, you know, are you king? That there was no questioning whatsoever. They didn't argue over his right to cast them out, to rule over them. They had to ask his permission because he was king. Would it be okay, you know, if we could, you know, if you're, when you cast us out, that we could go into this, 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 you know, herd of pigs? You see, they had to ask the king permission because he reigns and rules, and they knew it. So it's very interesting that the demons could not help but bow to Jesus as Lord even before he exercised them out, even before he cast them out. But we know that in this physical world, we know that he's not, Jesus is not always acknowledged as king by everyone. But we do know that eventually every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. And that scripture talks about every, everybody in, you know, above the earth and on the earth and below the earth. The entire creation will bow its knees to Jesus and acknowledge him that he is king of kings, right? But the king lives in us and therefore his power and authority is always present to conform our lives, bodies, circumstances, and so forth to the king's rule, to his will, so, we must learn how to have his rule manifest in our lives. This is the desire as king, as Jesus, is to manifest his rule in our bodies, so there'll be health, in our lives, so there'll be peace, there'll be joy, there'll be prosperity, in our relationships, and so forth. You see, it's the king's desire, it's the king's rule, right? He wants to rule in all areas of our lives and conform all areas of our lives according to his will. That's the desire of the king. This is the key. Jesus doesn't force his rule over us or his rule over our situations or circumstances. He doesn't force his way. His rule manifests to the level of our faith, our faith in his rule, 
our faith in his, his, his will coming forth. So his rule will manifest to the level of our faith. If we have no faith that the king is going to help us in our financial situations, chances are his rule will not be manifested in that situation. If we have absolutely no faith, you know, that Jesus heals today, then chances are the sickness that we have, if it can't be cured by doctors, chances are the sickness that we have will not be healed through Jesus' rule in our body if we do not believe that, if we don't have faith in that. So, the amount of God's rule in our life and in our circumstances is going to be because of the level of our faith in his rule manifesting. But make no mistake, Jesus desires as a king to manifest his rule over every aspect of our lives. And as our understanding and revelation of him as king grows and our faith grows, the manifestation of his rule in our lives and situation grows. There should be a progressive manifestation of Jesus' rule or the king's rule in our lives. It should be pro progressive. As we keep reading and, 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 and receiving understanding by the Holy Spirit and, and, and then our faith grows, we should see Jesus' rule progressively coming more widespread in our bodies, in our lives, in our finances, in our relationships. It should be progressive as, as the king, in a sense, takes over more land, more territory in us as his rule becomes, you know, manifested in every area of our, of our life, in our situations. We can acknowledge him as king, but that doesn't mean that he's ruling in all areas of our, of our lives, right? In all aspects of our lives. We may want him to, but again, that doesn't mean that he is. See, most of us would say, we know Jesus is king. We, we sang songs about it. We, we confess it. We know Jesus is king. But just knowing isn't going to be enough for his rule to manifest in all areas of our lives. He desires to work through us also to manifest his rule to other people. You know, when somebody gets saved, Jesus begins to rule in that person's life. When somebody gets healed, you see, his rulership over that person has increased. And of course, as I was saying before, when somebody gets delivered, Jesus' rule is increased in that person's life as well. So viewing things from this perspective is powerful. No longer will we have doubts whether God desires us to be healed or desires us to be, you know, blessed or delivered or whatever. He wants that because that is what his rule looks like, right? Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. It should look like heaven down here, right? It should look like heaven. It should be a reflection of heaven. He's king up there. That's what happens up here. He's king down here. That's what should be happening in our lives. Amen? So... We need to get a greater picture, a greater understanding of Jesus as king. We need to allow the Holy Spirit to bring us revelation on this. And this is something that David was talking about in his faith booster, allowing the Holy Spirit. We have the gift of the Holy Spirit. And if we have the gift of the Holy Spirit, we, can, we have everything, right? Because you see, here in this instance that I'm talking about, he, the Holy Spirit, will give us revelation about Jesus as king and the ramifications of that in our lives. So, but we need that. We need that understanding. But this is something that we cannot do on our own. You know, we, as I said, we need the revelation from the Spirit because we can't reason this out with our minds. We can sort of reasonably and with our minds accept, yeah, I know Jesus is king. But, you know, something supernatural happens when we dig into the Scriptures, when we start going over the Scriptures that talk about that Jesus is king. When we start viewing him, let's say, the way that Jesus is presented in Revelation is that, you know, that, that person, you know, with, a, with a, the glowing sash and the white robe and the eyes of fire. Then we start saying, wow, yeah, yeah, now I'm getting an idea of this. You know, when we start going over how, like, the, the demons acted in his presence, we go, wow, yeah, that's power, that's authority. And as we dig in and as we, med you know, meditate on these verses, the Holy Spirit will release, you know, like, faith and revelation and, and understanding into our minds. So we'll say, yeah, I get it. Jesus rules. So therefore... You know what? My finances are not according to his will. And I command in the name of Jesus, my finances increase according to how the king is ruling. See, we can line up with the king's rule, but it really needs revelation from the Holy Spirit to be able to do that. 
And that takes time. You see, it takes effort. It takes sacrifice. But eventually, faith is imparted to us. Amen. And the benefits outweigh anything, no matter what sacrifices you have to do. Okay, so you don't watch your favorite program for a while. Or you spend more time, whatever. Or you, 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 you fast and you pray, right? Any sacrifice is, 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 is not, you know, compared to what you will receive, you know, and the benefits. Amen. And I also like to say that revelation comes in levels as well. The Holy Spirit gives you one revelation. It's at one level. And it's not like you have it all, right? There's always deeper, higher, you know, more wonderful revelations of, of every subject, of Jesus as king. We'll never get to the end of revelation of Jesus as king. But like I said, the more revelation we get, the more his rule will be manifested in our lives. Amen. So, as our minds are renewed, there is progressive rulership of Jesus in our lives. <clears throat> now, fear, anxiety, worry indicate that we need to grow in our revelation as Jesus as king, right? When we do experience fear and anxiousness or worry, we need to stop and we need to say, okay, something's wrong here. If Jesus is king, I should be allowing him to rule in this situation that's causing anxiety and trust that the king's power will be released because that is his will. So when we start feeling like fear and anxiety and worry, we need to stop ourselves and say, whoa, 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 let's bring ourselves back here. Remember, Jesus is king and he rules in me and through me. So we need to stop ourselves before we, you know, go down that pathway. Digging in the word and getting revelation brings boldness to declare the commands of the king will be done in his name. Also complaining. Complaining. This indicates that we need to go in our revelation of Jesus as king. Every word of complaining is a declaration that God doesn't rule in that situation. So we don't really see it like that. You don't think we start complaining, I don't have this, I don't have that, or what about that? What you're doing is you're actually declaring that God's rule isn't manifesting in that area. And you need to dig in and you need to start confessing God's word and will over that area. And stop complaining. You see, it's so easy to go down the path of complaining. It seems to, you know, get faster and faster and faster. You start complaining, and before you know it, you've gone to a very dark place. And your mind has gone to a very dark place. So, and it's a place, a path that the Lord doesn't like. We have to remember what happened to the Israelites in the desert when they started to complain. And I was reading about one uh, episode this week in Numbers 11 when they were complaining they wanted meat. And they were complaining was so bad the Lord sent a fire to consume some of them. Now the thing was that the Lord had already provided manna. He had already provided meat before. But they went down this whole path of complaining. They seemed it was almost habitual for them. And I think complaining can almost become habitual for you. You know, you complain and you go down. And the next thing you know, you're, you're way down here in this realm of, you know, you can't even get the faith to get out of it. So we need to stop the complaining. We need to stop ourselves and just think, no, I'm not going to complain because that's saying that God's will, you know, isn't going to manifest in here, in my, in my situation. So we need to be very careful of complaining. We need to stay on the lighted path. So when you hear yourself complain, catch yourself. Refocus on Jesus as king. Right? And we need to say, I receive your rule in this situation. That's what I've been saying in my life this week, as crazy things have happened this week. I kept saying no. I'm not going to get freaked out, I'm not going to get worried, and I'm not going to get, I'm not going to, well, I did complain a bit until I started to stop myself, until the Lord spoke to me about complaining, I'm going to say no. I'm going to say, you know what, God rules in this situation, so I'm not going to worry about it, and I left it. And as we do this, we will see God's rule manifest that will bolster our faith, and we'll be able to have faith for greater things, greater problems, Right? Amen. We will always come out on top and victorious. Any enemy that comes against us, whatever it is, will be, you know, will be scattered. So, just to sum it up, you need to spend time with God, meditating on the scriptures to receive revelation as Jesus as king. And the ramifications of his being king living in you. That's a whole other sermon about the king living in you. And I touched on that a few weeks ago. God actually lives in us and what, you know, we should meditate on that because that's mind-blowing, right? As we spend time in the scripture, we are giving our spirit, our soul, and our body the good nutrition from the word, allowing that living water to flow through you. 
You know, plants, when they don't get the proper nutrients or water, they're susceptible to pests and disease. That's the same with us. If we don't get the proper nutrients from the Word of God and get that, you know, that living water flowing through us, we're going to be susceptible to pests as well. Pests like complaining and worry and doubt and fear. But as we feed ourselves on the Word of God and feed ourselves on the good nutrients from the Word of God, we'll be able to get rid of all the pests. But they, they won't bother us whatsoever and we will bring forth fruit. Amen. So let's picture him as the king that he is. Because when you get a revelation of Jesus as king, you will know that his word is law and it will manifest. Amen. Let's stand up. Father God, we just give you thanks and praise. Lord Jesus, we just honor you. You are the king of kings and the Lord of lords. And Father God, I just pray for that revelation of you as king to come more and more and more, Father God, as we, we draw close to you. We need greater revelation, Jesus, as you as king. So we can step out of this building and we can manifest your rule for people, Father God. We can pray for people and see them healed. We can pray for people and see them delivered. We can pray for people and they will have miracles in your life because that is your rule. Your rule will come forth in their lives, Father God. Because you want to take territory. You want your rule to expand. Expand. And we just thank you for that, Father God. So, Father God, thank you for the revelation. New revelation coming. And we bless you and we praise you. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen.